For tape, CDs, DVDs, to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. This is the 2015 Summer Family Teaching and Deliverance Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Camp in Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Sunday afternoon, July the 5th, 2015. Jerry McGee is the speaker of this service, teaching on bitterness. All right, Miss Jerry's here, so let's welcome Miss Jerry McGee and uh, enjoy. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless your holy name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Bless you, Lord. How many of you were blessed by Kurna's message on how the greatness and bigness of God? Amen. Isn't that awesome? We have a big God, and why wouldn't we want to go run and jump in his lap? Does he have a lap? (laughs) I'm sure he does. (laughs) Lord, we just praise you for your goodness and your mercy and your bigness and your awesomeness. We praise you, Lord, that you did create us into your image. Father, we just ask that you be glorified in our lives, in Jesus' name. Praise you, Lord. Who knows how to run the PowerPoint? Okay, Lord, we just praise you that you are a tree of life. We praise you that rivers of living water come forth from our innermost being. We praise you, Lord, that you sent your word to heal us. Not folks, but you sent your word to heal us. Thank you that you're the great physician, the great I am, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the commander-in-chief of all the armies of heaven. We give you praise. We bless you. We exalt you. We honor you. Lord, thank you for the message we heard about your greatness and about your bigness. And God, we just thank you and praise you for what you're going to do here today, the remainder of this uh, camp. We thank you for the message that will come forth tonight and tomorrow. And Lord, we want to exalt you. We want you to be glorified. I pray, Lord, that you download me with whatever you want to accomplish your purpose at this hour in Jesus' name. We just thank you that we've been raised to sit with Christ in heavenly places for above principalities and powers. We have authority over all the power of the enemy, and you said nothing will by any means injure us. Father, in the name of Jesus, we take our seat in the heavenly places, and we bind you, Satan, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, wicked spirits in heavenly places. We bind you in the heavenly places, and on this earth, we forbid you to work with, communicate with, make contact with anyone on this earth or in the heavenly places to work divination against us or this meeting. In Jesus' name, this camp, anything that concerns us, in Jesus' name, we praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. Worthy are you. Yes. Yes. Worthy are you. Praise you, Lord. We bind every spirit that would not confess Jesus Christ as Lord. In Jesus' name. Well, this thing doesn't want... I tell you. This isn't the Three Stooges. (laughs) When my kids were little, they did watch Laurel and Hardy and... Well, was that, no, the Laurel and Hardy was not the Three Stooges. Mojo and Kip Curly. <laughs> Praise you, Lord. But that has nothing to do with this message in Jesus' name. <laughs> but to, to today, uh, I want to talk about a root of bitterness and how a root of bitterness comes into us. Um, kind of shared that we were created in God's image. And in, in um, Genesis 5... He said, and God said in his word, after Adam had lived 120 years, he had a son in his own image and named him Seth. So in the garden, because of sin, um, we lost the image of God because of sin. And so when we come to Christ, uh, he wants to restore his image in us. Because the scripture says, uh, everything works together for good. You don't have to say, oh, no, another problem. 
God said, everything works together for good to those that love the Lord, to the call according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew he predestined to become conformed into the image of his son. So God uses your trials to, deli- to discipline you, not necessarily because he's mad. He could be mad if you're not being obedient, you, you could be killed. Um, because he, he's going to discipline every son whom he loves. But it, it doesn't necessarily mean he's angry with us. It could mean he just wants to correct some things in us by allowing us to go through the trials. And so in your trial, you'll do one of two things. You'll either go to God and let him discipline you, correcting those mistakes, and get conformed more into his image. How many of you know that we are a work in progress, and the more we repent, the more we deal with our sin at the throne of grace, the more of God image, in God's image we get. And we're being restored back to the image he created us to be. And I believe in these last days we're going to be doing some of the things that uh, Kerna talked about that God was. He says, greater works will you do because I go to the Father. And so, in fact, we look like God, and he's going to fix us, and the more we allow him to conform us into his image, back into the, back into what he originally created us to be, and only through Calvary, only through knowing the Lord, can we ever be, be being conformed into his image. And so how you respond to life circumstances will det- determine if you get conformed in the image of Christ or into the image of the beast, depending on how you respond to your trials. You'll either get better through letting God conform you to his image, or you'll get bitter and be conformed into the image of the beast. And you'll receive a root of bitterness. You know, the Bible says there's a throne of grace we can go to, and at that throne of grace we get confirmed, established, perfected, uh, and we get more conformed into his image. And uh, if we don't go to the throne of grace, we come short of the great throne of grace, and we receive a root of bitterness. Hebrews 12 says, "Seek peace and pursue it uh, without pursue peace for without pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord." So uh, King James says, "Without holiness, no man will see the Lord." It says, see to it that no root of bitterness springing up in you causing trouble, and by it many be defiled. It goes on to tell you about Esau, who sold his birthright for a pot of soup, and he, even though he sought it with tears, the Bible said he found no place for repentance. And so that's really a picture of people that call themselves Christians, people that don't let God discipline them, people that have claimed to be Christ. Uh, belong to Christ and they don't allow God to discipline them God says they're illegitimate children and he said that so the only way we can be legitimate children is to allow him to conform us into his image and we do that by going to his throne of grace the Bible says in Hebrews 4 that there's a throne of grace we can go to and and, uh, we have to humble ourselves to get there I heard somebody say something the other day that was so good it says that when you don't know what to do, humble yourself. And he's in the, and because God is opposed to the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. I need his favor, don't you? And I want to humble myself. Bitterness can be defined according to Webster's 1828 dictionary as a dangerous era or schism, a breach of charity, breach of love, tending to draw people to apostasy, which is abandonment of what they once professed. Um, it means extreme enmity, ill will, grudge, hatred. You see, whenever we go through a trial, and there's usually another person involved in that trial, at least one person involved in that trial, it, regards, it requires that I forgive that person by sundown. And if I don't, I receive a root of bitterness. And so I've got till sundown to go to the throne of grace to find mercy in time of need. And so if I don't go to the throne of grace, I let the sun go down on my anger. And the next day I have a a spirit of unforgiveness. And then the next day, bitterness. 
and someone has said, and you've heard this before, bitterness is like drinking poison and wanting someone else to die. And so we have to forgive because that's the sin that's unforgivable. God says if you don't forgive, he won't forgive you. It it means hatred, ill will, grudges, irreconcilable enmity. Uh, It means anger of emotions and passions. It means sharpness, severity of temper, biting, sarcasm, extreme wickedness. In the Hebrew, bitterness means uh, discouragement, a feeling of hopelessness. I can't get out of this situation. I'm stuck. Life's never going to be any better. It's hopeless. It is hopeless if you don't go to the throne of grace. And I want to talk about why we don't go to the throne of grace. We don't see that big God that uh, Kerna told us about this morning. We have a perverted image of God, and that comes in through the, the, the perversion of our forefathers. We see God unconsciously until God delivers us. We see God as our the same way we saw our earthly parents. And because of that, instead of going to the throne of grace, we're afraid to go. Or we think God's a liar. If our parents were a liar, then no use going to a liar. Or if our parents didn't want the best for us, then we, 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 we don't want to go because God's going to give me some kind of raw deal like my parents did. Or say, I don't go to God because uh, my parents never, maybe my daddy was never there, my mother was never there, they never, they never guided me, they never directed me, they never led me, they never gave me good instruction. So when I go through a trial, the lie is God is not going to give me instruction either. And it's hard for me to believe that God says in James, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberally and upbraids not. And God gives liberally to us, but we have to humble ourselves and go to the throne of grace. And, you know, to get delivered and to walk in victory, you're first going to have to deal with your mother-daddy issues and the perverted way you saw God. And so I was really blessed by that message this morning because I don't think I'll ever forget some of those things. You know, God, God has been big to me. Because I had a daddy and mother that never lied to me. They never, they always wanted the best for me. They always uh, would guide me. They'd always lead me. I could always depend on them to protect me. So it's easy for me to believe God's going to protect me in these days. Because I've never not been protected a day in my life. I've never felt unloved a day in my life. But you see, if, if I was never loved, I would have a hard time believing God loves me. You know, people that are illegitimately conceived, most of them believe they're a mistake, that they um, have to earn the right to be here. They'll either be a total rebel, rebel or they will be perf- a perfectionist in an area, in any area they can gain acceptance, to feel like that they have to earn their right to be here. God allows you. You are not a mistake if you're that person. You're not a mistake. God lets you be born. He knew when your father's sperm met your mother's egg exactly who he wanted you to be and what he wanted you to accomplish. And like we told some people this morning, there's nobody like you. There's nobody can do the job that God created you to do. You're not a mistake. You are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus under good works. And you have a loving Heavenly Father that's much better than my my earthly father who was not perfect by any means. But he gave me a good concept of who God was and who God is. And so that's the reason we faint, we give up, we quit, we take a nosedive. And if you're a fainter ever in married, every time you have a problem, you want a divorce. How do I know? Because every time my husband had a problem with me, he wanted a divorce. If I'd have had a nickel for every time he said he wanted a divorce, my goodness, I'd be rich right now. And I am rich in Christ. In Jesus' name, thank the Lord. I thank the Lord for all that I learned through the trials that I went through living with him. And I surely was not uh, all rosy myself. Far from it. In fact, I'm thinking... Dear Lord, poor guy. (laughs) Bless his heart. (laughs) You know, God, God puts people together that are best able to fulfill each other's reaping process. You know, iron sharpens iron like one man sharpens another. 
if you're married, if you can remember this, the problems you have with your mate, 99 and 9 tenths percent of the time, they're the same problems and issues and judgments you made of your mother and father. Had I did, had I realized that, even though I was teaching this then, it never clicked. But I'm thinking, when you have a problem with your mate, go in your prayer closet and say, Lord, how does this relate to my childhood? What unresolved issue do I have that I need to have you correct? In Jesus' name. But you see, we get a root, we receive a root of bitterness because we don't go to God. We don't go to that big God, uh, Curtin was telling us about. We don't go to this God that is so huge, He fills up the universe. A God that can, uh, from the breath of His nostrils, burn down things and put His feet in the water and dry up the waters. That's the kind of God we serve. He loves you. He's all-knowing. He's omnipotent. He is a God that is nothing, it, it not even a, a speck like your mother and father. But he's a perfect God. And so uh, bitterness also means terminal death. In Numbers 5, if a, if a man thought his wife was committing physical adultery, he would take her to the priest. And the priest would mix up some dirt from the temple floor, which was full of germs, and mix it with water. And if she was guilty, her stomach would swell and her thigh would waste away. It goes on to say she was, uh, she'd be bitter and she'd be barren. Bitter, uh, bitterness causes you to be barren. It causes you to fall away from what you once embraced. In fact, in, in, Re- in Revelation chapter 9, it depicts Satan as the star that fall Lucifer as the star that falls from heaven, and it was called wormwood. And so, when we follow Jesus, we're going to get sweeter and sweeter, not bitter, more bitter. If bitterness is something that characterizes your life, listen, you're on the wrong path. But God offers us a throne of grace that we can go to. You know, the children of Israel in Exodus. 15, when they went through the wilderness and there was no water and they, the water was bitter and they called it Mara. And uh, so the solution for that bitter water where they didn't have water was to put a, a tree in there and that tree represents Christ. And Jesus coming to the throne of grace, letting God deal with your issues, sweetens you, sweetens the problem. But when you come short of the grace of God, you have a root of bitterness that springs up, causes trouble, and you defile many, yourself and others, and you're just like Esau who sells his birthright for a pot of soup, and even though you seek it with tears, if you find no place for repentance, you are cut off. In fact, in John 15, it says, if you don't produce fruit, you're like a branch cut off and burned. Uh, bitterness also means grief. It's spiritual adultery. It's fruitlessness. Causes you, opens you up to eternal death. Ephesians 4.31 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Redemption. <clears throat> Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, uh, along with all malice. And be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Hebrews 4.14 says, Therefore, we have a great high priest, the biggest, the, the, the hugest God in the universe, the King of Kings, we have this great high priest who has passed through this, the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest that cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one which we have been, um, tend- one who's been tempted in all things like us, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near to the throne of grace so that we may find mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In your trial, you'll either be conformed to Christ, more to his image, to restore the, the purpose of working out your salvation with fear and trembling, of being conformed to his image, is to to 
bring you back to what God created you to be. And we we all know that the, we've all got so much junk in us that we don't have a whole lot of glory shining through. But God wants us to sparkle with his glory. Uh, I liked one of the definitions was it was like the luminaries of the, the, the light. God wants us to be light bearers. He says, let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. In fact, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. But he said, you're the light of the world, disciples. And let your light so shine. And there's not been a whole lot of shining in the body of Christ. And God's got to clean us up. We look like, we've looked like the Fredericks of Hollywood. And God's coming like a, coming for a pure, holy, sparkly bride that glorifies Jesus. And so you'll either be conformed to your, to Christ and have His image, or you'll be conformed to the beast, which is wormwood, bitterness. Uh, 1 Corinthians 8, when somebody wounds your conscience with food, and I shared this last night, uh, they can, they can um, cause a weak brother to stumble. And so our root of bitterness can defile many because when somebody wounds us, they put their image in us, and so we have to forgive them to ask God to conform us into his image. Romans uh, 2, 1 says you become like who you judge. And so when you hold unforgiveness, it's like they're, they're hanging around your neck through a torment. You're tormented. In fact, in Matthew 18, uh, go ahead and uh, do the first one, Randy. Uh, there's a throne of grace that you can go to. At the throne of grace, you get strengthened, confirmed, established, and perfected. And go to the next one. And he, God offers us. He says, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Whatever the situation is, he'll give you rest. Isaiah 26 says, he'll keep you in perfect peace when your mind is stayed upon him because you are trusting in him. And so when, in Matthew 5, it tells us to make friends quickly with our opponent. Well, we're with him on the way, lest he turn you over to the judge. And we know there's one judge, and that's God. And the judge to the officer, that's a demon, and you'd be thrown in prison, and it's a spiritual prison. So every person you're angry at, let me tell you, if you're angry at somebody, that means that you have received a root of bitterness, and you're holding unforgiveness toward them. And then it says, make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you're with him on the way. You see, God's got a courtroom. And if we don't forgive, he won't forgive us. He tells us that in the word of God. And so uh, every place you're angry with someone, you're in a spiritual prison. If you're angry at a thousand people, you're in a thousand different prisons. And God goes on to say in Matthew 5 that if you, you'll not come out of that prison until you pay up the last cent. Now, before, in Ephesians 4, it, it says, uh, 4.26, it says, um, do not let the sun go down on your anger and give the, unless you give the devil an opportunity. And so we have till sundown to forgive. And if we don't forgive, we're turned over to the tormentors, and it says that in Matthew uh, 18. So we have to forgive. And so um, you'll stay in prison until you forgive that person. And see, that prison is a spiritual prison. We know we don't go to jail every time we're angry at somebody unless we kill somebody. Now, before it says, don't let the sun go down on your anger, it says, be angry and sin not. What does that mean? I used to think it meant to say, when my husband would say, are you angry? And I'd say, no. Are you, are you sure not angry? No. Well, you sure have a funny look on it. No, I'm not angry. Have you ever done that? That's not what it means. It means to say, yes, I'm angry. Yes, I have a right to be angry. But you know what? I love Jesus so much that I'm going to choose by an act of my will to forgive you. And the way you forgive, usually when people push your buttons, the Lord showed me how to forgive. Uh, whenever, whenever you can quickly forgive somebody, if they say, Jerry, forgive me for what I said yesterday. I say, well, what did you say? Didn't think anything of it. That's not a hard issue. But if you can't forgive somebody, it goes back to a judgment that you made on your mother and father or someone else, usually your mother and father. And so when you forgive the parent that has treated you just like the turkey in the present, 
it's easy to forgive. So if you can quickly forgive, it's not a hard issue. But it, because you won't let the sun go down on it. But if you can't forgive quickly, and you say, I say the words, I forgive, and next week or tomorrow or the next day, I'm still arguing with, with them in my head. I haven't forgiven them. That's a, that's a hard issue. You see, I've discovered that uh, if you're, like if your parents don't reject you, you can go through life, and if you feel loved when you're growing up, you can go through life, and if somebody else don't love you, it's okay. I mean, you don't, you would want everybody to love you, but if they don't love you, it's okay. Or if somebody rejects you, it might hurt for a minute. But you know what? You have a steadfastness that that won't rock your boat forever. But people that grow up in traumatic situations and dysfunctional families, uh, all of those issues that they had that they didn't deal with in childhood, they have to deal with now. And that's how we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Because God did create us into his image but he ha- he wants to conform us back into his image, the image that we lost in the garden. And thank God we came to Christ because that's the only possible way we can ever be restored is to uh, know, know Jesus as our Savior and Lord. And I'm going to say as Lord. He, but if he's not Lord of your life, he's the boss of your life, you need to get saved. This is the bottom line. You need You need Jesus. The church is full of people that have a head knowledge of God, believe in Jesus, the demons believe and tremble. But not many people are truly like what the brother prophesied this morning about God's remnant. God's remnant are those, the purified remnant. Those that God wants, God irons out the, the spots and the wrinkles. And we've got spots and wrinkles that have to be ironed out. Right? And we better let him iron us out or he's going to say, or iron them out, or he's going to say, depart from me, I never even knew you. I'm going to say something else. If you say you know the Lord and it's so hum and you're never in his word, you're not interested in hearing his word, you need to get saved. You're one of those believers in your head, but not believers in your heart. Isn't that right? And so until we forgive, it's like that person we're holding bitterness toward is wrapped around our neck. It's like we're a slave to that bitterness. What God allows in your life, he's allowing for your purification. He's allowing the trials in your life so that you can find the answers, so that you can go to the throne of grace and he can fix you. And that's why God says in, in uh, James, count it all joy when you go through various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and you have need of endurance. And after you have done the will of God, then you'll receive what's promised. Okay? And the next thing, in Matthew 18, Jesus gives a parable of a Lord who had two slaves, and one owed about $10 million, and one owed about $18. And the one who owed, who was, owed the Lord $10 million, uh, the Lord said, pay up, or I'm going to throw you and your wife in, in prison. And the Lord said, have mercy, the Lord had mercy on this slave. And then he goes out and finds someone that owes him about $18, and he says, pay up, and and so he's likening this to an unforgiving heart. It's kind of like God delivered. God has forgiven us for more than ten million dollars, and if we hold eighteen dollar debt against somebody and put them in prison, then what happens is we put them in, in a spiritual prison through our judgments concerning us. They're in a prison. And they'll stay there and not come out of there until we forgive them. They may love everyone else and not love us because we've judged them. And the Bible says, whosoever sins you retain or retain, whosoever sins you remit or remit it. So we have to remit people's sins. So the next one, when you hold, when it goes on in Matthew 18, whenever you, uh, this slave that had been forgiven for $10 million goes out and finds someone that owes him $18 and he chokes him and says, pay up. And he says, I can't. I can't pay. So the slave that had been forgiven throws the one who owes him eighteen dollars in prison. And and he and, and can so, Randy, will you read that? Will you come up here and read that? What it says? That slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, and he seized him and began to choke him, saying, "Pay back what you owe." Right. Okay. The next one. So we put other people in prison concerning us. Well, as an example, when you make a judgment towards somebody, say that I, 
I judge uh, Dr. Deborah there, and she's such a blessing, and I'm not judging her. But just say I judge her because I think she rejects me every time I see her. She doesn't. But just say I say that, and I make that judgment. I put her in prison concerning me. She's not able to do anything but reject me till I let her out of the prison I put her in. Does that make sense? Okay, and so then, and read that, Randy. At the 1834, and his Lord, moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed. Okay, now the torturers, read all the things the torturers do. That's demons, recall, torture, regret, wounds, guilt, pain, insanity, depression, sickness, vexation, anger, hatred, grief, and bitterness. And see, um, when... The Lord of the slave, it would be like, um, I'm holding unforgiveness toward Deborah. God's just forgiven me for $10 million. And say, Deborah, you owe me $18. Pay up. And she can't pay, so I throw her in prison. And then Carla sees what I did. So they, she goes and tells the Lord on me. And the Lord says, you wicked slave. Now, he's talking to Peter because he told Peter you're going to have to forgive seven times seven in the first part of that passage. And he said, he said, you wicked slave. Now he's calling a Peter a wicked slave. He says, so shall my heavenly father do to you if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. From the heart is those issues where you can't forgive. How many of you have said, I forgive somebody, and then the next day you're still ordering with them in your head? You know you have to forgive, and you're trying The reason you can't forgive is because it has to be from the heart. The heart is that treasure that's been stored in your life from the time you were little children. If my mother and daddy loved me, it doesn't matter. I mean, it makes me sad if nobody else loves me, but I'm telling you, I feel loved for if nobody else loves me or not. You see what I'm saying? Because however you're trained up is how your life goes. If you're trained up to be rejected, If I had been rejected, I tell you the area where I felt rejected was in the area of being fat. That's the only place I felt rejected. And when I lost lost weight, I got my daddy's acceptance. And when I gained a pound, he didn't like that. And so there was rejection there. So how did that affect me? I always felt people rejected me because of fat, 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 fat. But had he accepted me in that area, I would have never felt rejected. I can say Carla probably never feels rejected in that area, in any area. Because God's brought about a lot of healing. The things that, that I'm, that were, that I'm sharing are things that God has walked me through and given me answers. You know, I always want the answer of why this happens the way it does. And that goes back to a daddy, no matter, no matter what I asked him, he had an answer for me. So, I believe Daddy God's got an answer for me. You see what I'm saying? My daddy could always figure something out. So, so, and I'm, and I'm not sharing that to say, ha ha, I had a daddy like this. Had I not had that, I would have never known the difference. For years, I thought everybody had parents like me, and they weren't perfect. They made a lot of mistakes, but, but love covers a multitude of sin. I I never can remember a time in my life that my parents did not want what was best for me. And I can tell you, God is so much more than that. God is in heaven, and he, He just longs for you to run to Him. And the reason you don't go is because you have a perverted image of who He is. And I was so thankful for Colonel's message because he expanded on that to tell us the bigness of God. And so... So we go into a prison, and, and, and God says, so Carla comes, and t- she tells the God on me. God says, you wicked slave, I'm going to turn you over to, and so shall my heavenly father to do to you, Peter. I'm going to turn you over to the tormentors. And so shall my heavenly father do to you. Tormentors in the Greek means demons that inflict pain. It means the pain of disease. Can I tell you that cancer is rooted in bitterness? Arthritis is rooted in bitterness. Um, and, and, and bitterness is just unforgiveness and anger. You get angry, you get hold unforgiveness, but the sun goes down your anger, and the next day it's bitter. And you can be a person that's not a bitter person, but have areas of bitterness toward people that have hurt you. 
Or you can just be such a bitter, grouchy person that you're just full of bitterness. But the areas where we have bitterness, we have to get over those areas because if we don't, they'll become a festering sore that'll work out in us, in us cancer, bone, uh, bone cancer. Um, Dr. Deborah said something the other day that I don't know if you heard, but also, bone, but also bitterness goes down into the bone and it causes anemia. You know, some butts back, my precious friend, before she even was diagnosed, she said, I think I'm anemic. Now we find out she's got bone uh, cancer in the spine. And I'm not pleased, I am not judging her at all. But I, but if God teaches me something through somebody, I think I'm obligated to teach it to, so that we can be careful if we think we stand lest we fall. And I'm telling you, this woman, I've known her many years, and she's been a godly woman. She wears a Bible out about every year. I'm thinking, dear Lord, if this is going to happen to her, I better watch my P's and Q's. So I had to say, Lord, I have to have, I have to have an understanding of this because I don't understand why this woman has suffered so much. But fear will do that to you. Fear, stress, and fear, if you don't overcome it, will absolutely destroy you. So we're to count it all joy when we go through various trials knowing that the testing of our faith produces endurance. So when you go through a trial, learn to ask God, go to God. Because if you don't go to God, you faint, you give up, you quit, and you have a root of bitterness. Go to God and let him fix you. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And the word says, he will exalt you. Okay, just some of the things that bitterness can cause. Bone cancer, arthritis, um, like if you have it in a part of your body, it has what well, the part of the body that you have it in has to do with um, the type of bitterness. I know I have a friend whose husband left her for another woman, and she has to stand. She had to stand and be a hairdresser, and she was bitter because she had to stand on her feet because her husband left her, and she had arthritis in her feet. You have arthritis in your hands that has to do with ministry. If you have hand problems, ask God, what have, what have I done with my hand that would cause me to have this problem with my hands? I've got a little a place here that I don't know if it's like a calcium deposit or what, but God showed me it was from jerking dogs around. You know, I, I try to take a dog from one kennel to the other, and they didn't want to cooperate, and they, they would want to drag me down the hill, and I'd get angry at them. And that's what the Lord showed me that was from. And I've repented. I now talk to them nice when I walk them down the hill. <laughs> and so let me just get to the end of this. I'm going to leave out a bunch. Um, causes of persistent bitterness. I had the same problem in my life I'm judging someone else for. And I shared with you just this week. There's not a day that goes by I don't get delivered of something. But I shared with you this week. So somebody said something to somebody and it just grieved me so bad. I just thought, I cannot believe this person with this mouth they have. I cannot believe the words they spoke. And God just said, you did the very same thing. A lot of times when it's raining on our parade, it's because it's working in us. Um, Partially my fault. I have an attempt at revenge. Temporal value systems, greed. I'm just greedy. Uh, take up offenses for others. And that's what I was doing when somebody was talking to them in a bad way. I was taking up offenses. But I've forgiven this person. And it's easier to forgive when you see yourself. You say, God just let that happen to give me a mirror of my own self. Uh, but bitterness comes in um, in our lives. Through idolatry, through um, loss of expectation, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Allowing others to control me. You know, the only yoke that produces love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control is the yoke of Jesus. If somebody, if I let somebody control me, let me tell you something, it, it creates bitterness in my life. I might be putting on an act like, it's okay, I'm in denial, I don't really realize it, but let me tell you, you're bitter about it. 
um, con- and if you're controlling others. You know, if I'm controlling others, I'm trying to conform you into my image of what I think, which is idolatry. We do this with our kids. We have this standard of what we will think we want them to be, and we don't give them the pre- freedom to fail. And that's how we learn. That's how you and I have learned. Unresolved hurt. Even the pressure of work. We prayed for people that were angry about having to work. Loss, of, and I'm not, and if you're in here, I'm not making fun of you at all. I'm just, help, I'm saying, sharing something that will help other people. Divorce. Oh my goodness. That could be a big cause of bitterness and anger. And probably the reason you went through a divorce is because you saw that person just like you saw your mother and dad and you thought they were the turkey and the turkey was really God was trying to mirror what he was trying to fix in you. Childhood trauma, being pressured to achieve, can't do anything right, you have to do everything perfect. Hey, all you have to do is yield to the potter and the potter is not like your mom and dad. Your mom and dad, if you were, if you grew up with having to perform, they taught you to turn the potter's wheel, which is legalism. But when you abide in Christ, the potter fixes you. And all that you do is the clay yields to the potter. The potter fashions you, molds you, makes you, uh, beats the bubbles out of you. And that's what he's trying to do to a lot of us right now. He's beating the bubbles out through letting us go through things. I don't think I've ever uh, seen how many trials that people in the body of Christ are having right now. I believe God's using that to clean us up for these days so we can operate in the the true, the way God created us to be in the garden with the power that he has so we can do greater works than he did because he went to the Father and he created us just like him. But we don't look like him right now, do we? But that's why we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, being, pre- being pressured to perform, to, to achieve. Uh, you know, if, 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 I'm in, in, if I'm a perfectionist, I, I'm driven to do everything perfect. And it's God wants us to do everything perfect. But when we're driven to do it, that's demonic. Words spoken over you are spiritual powers either bringing life to you or death. Many of us are failing because, have failed because of the words we spoke over ourselves and the words that other people have spoken over us. Being defiled by someone else's root of bitterness, uh, rejection opens us up to anger and rage, not love. Husbands that don't nurture their wives, and I can tell you they don't nurture because daddy and mother didn't nurture. That's why it's an issue. If mother and daddy nurture, you don't even think about getting nurtured or taken care of because your parents took care of you. Being pushed into the wrong role, the lack of nurture. Consequences of bitterness is cancer, death, barren, unfruitful, apostasy, being conformed to Satan's image instead of God's image, physical and chemical imbalance, Lower resistance, aching teeth, because if you're angry, it puts pressure on your teeth, grinding your teeth. You know, I used to have this recurring dream, <laughs> it was demonic for sure, but that my teeth, I would grit my teeth in my dream till they just crumbled. And see, that shows there was some bitterness and agitation even in my childhood, and it was always the issue of fat. That was the only issue that I feel like I had. I mean, I had issues, but that was the only one that tormented me was weight problem. And most illnesses today are are the result of bitterness and guilt. And Bill Gothard says this, germs will not live on your body or have any effect unless there's bitterness and guilt in your life. Hardened facial features, Psalms 32 says, When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away, which means became old and wore out. Bone diseases. Bitterness goes right into the bones because the blood's made in the bone marrow. Psychological problems. Depression. Barrenness. Heart problems. Hopeless hope deferred makes the heart sick. Spiritual identification, because I've become like the one that I'm judging. 
depression. Bitterness quenches the Holy Spirit. Bitterness will hold you into immaturity. No development of character until you repent of bitterness. Bitterness means barrenness, rotten bones, arthritis. So what I want you to do is I want you to stand up and I want you to forgive your parents for every negative. You can, you can bless the Lord for all the positive things later. But all the negative things in your life that has caused you to see God the same way. God is harsh. He's cruel. He's mean. He's raging. He was, he, he never said he loved me. God never said, my dad never said he loved me. So Lord, just let the, just do this first. Let's do the Holy Spirit. Just deal with this first. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you everything negative about your earthly father and your earthly mother. Just make a list. And, and generally you've said, I forgive them. I know you have. But the, every instance has to be forgiven. If they beat you, Lord, I forgive them for beating me. If they were couch potatoes, I forgive them for being couch potatoes. If they were alcoholics, I forgive them for being an alcoholic. You have to be specific to forgive every instance in order to get over the roots of bitterness in those areas. And also, so that the lie you received about God uh, will be abolished. So you can see God in his true character. So, Lord, search my heart. Test my thoughts. Lord, let me know the truth that sets me free. Lord, would you please show me every negative thing about my father and mother so I can be free of bitterness. And then just sit down when you're through, and we'll deal with that, and then we'll deal with the root of bitterness. Lord, I forgive my father and mother for everything you've shown me. I renounce the lie that you, God, are just like them. That has kept me from going to your throne of grace, because I've had a perverted image of you. And I ask you to forgive me. I thank you that you're always there. You always hear me. And Lord, I thank you that you love me with an everlasting love. That you protect me in these days. That I don't have to protect myself. Because Lord, you are the king. You are the commander in chief. And Lord, I break the judgments I made on my mother and father. And Lord, in Jesus' name, um, forgive me for turning to promises I made myself. That when, when I grow up, life's going to be different. I forgive my mother and father for provoking me to anger. And Lord, I just um, break soul ties with them. I break the judgments I made against them. Forgive me for dishonoring my mother and father through not forgiving them by sundown. Forgive me for turning to idols instead of turning to you. Lord, I forgive my parents for their harsh abuse that has set me up to have their familiar spirit. And I break soul ties with them, call back my soul and spirit from them, send back their souls and spirits, exchange their image for the image of Christ. Now I command every lying spirit that has lied to them about God. God's not there. God abandons you. I break the power of those lies. I command every spirit to leave. Now, fear, doubt, unbelief, worry, anxiety, tension, stress, nervousness. I command in the name of Jesus, anger to go. I command every lying spirit to go. All deception has to go. Every spirit that's hindered them from going to the throne of grace, I break your power. All fainting spirits, all spirits that cause them to lose heart, want to run, want a divorce, I break your power in the mighty name of Jesus. I command you to go now in Jesus' name. I break your power in the mighty name of Jesus. I command all anger, hostility, wormwood, Lucifer. I command wormwood in Jesus' name. I command you to go. Abaddon, Apollyon, I break your power in the name of Jesus. I command the image of the beast to go in Jesus' name. I break your power. Lord, I forgive my parents for training me up in the way I should not go. I ask you to break those defaults. Because I forgive them in Jesus' name. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, mighty God. Bless you, Lord. 
Bless you, Lord. Worthy are you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. All spirits of pride. All spirits of dishonoring mother and father, go. All spirits that came in through idolatry, I threw the vows they made. I break the power of all the vows in the name, power, blood, and authority of Jesus. All the vows that they made, they'll never be like daddy. They'll never be like mother. I break your power in Jesus' name. Praise you, God. Depression, woundedness, hurt. I press them out. I bandage them. I soften them with oil in the name of Jesus. I break the expectations that all women are like my mother, that all men are like my daddy. I break the power in Jesus' name. I command the familiar spirits of mom and dad out in the name of Jesus. I break the power of every familiar spirit. In Jesus' name, all spirits that cause them to lose heart, give up, quit, want a divorce, go in Jesus' name. All spirits of abandonment, all orphan spirits. Uh, God says he will not leave you as an orphan. All orphan spirits have to go now in Jesus' name. All hostility. Lord, forgive me for wanting to kill my parents. All spirits of murder, you leave now in Jesus' name. All spirits of retaliation and grudges in Jesus' name. All spirits of wanting to abuse parents, go. All spirits of child abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, mental abuse, emotional abuse, go. All spirits of child abuse. Go in Jesus' name. All spirits that tell them they won't be protected in these days. All spirits that tell them they have to help themselves in these days. All spirits that tell them that God's going to abandon them, leave them, not help them. That they're going to have to fight this end time thing by themselves. That's a lie. I break the power of that lie. I break the power of fear, torment, uh, hysteria, panic. I break your power. Panic attacks, asthma. I break your power. Autoimmune diseases, I break your power in the name of Jesus. Lord, would you reset that default in the name of Jesus because they've received your discipline. They have received your correction. They've received your discipline. Praise you, Lord. Rebellion has to go. Self-pity has to go. Martyrdom has to go. Anger and rage of father and mother leave now in Jesus' name. Control of mother and father. I break the yokes off their necks in Jesus' name. Every spirit that tells them that God is controlling God, nobody's going to control them, that would open them up to rebellion. God is not like mom and dad. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, mighty God. Bless you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Worthy are you, Lord. You inhabit our praises. Thank you that we order our conversation aright. You show us your salvation. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Worthy are you. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, though. We feel a release. Lift your hands and sing with me. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Lord, fill every place. Fill the daddy hole in my heart. Fill the mama hole. Give me a revelation of how much you love me. Send the spirit of adoption on your children, Lord, in Jesus' name. Okay, now I want you to stand up and I want you to forgive every person that, um, yes, praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. All grief has to go. Sorrow, broken heart, you have to leave now in Jesus' name. All spirit of a broken heart, you have to go. In Jesus' name, praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name, broken heart, you have to go. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord, that you're healing Little Rock. Praise you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Okay, Lord, who do I need to forgive? I'm going to share this. I shared part of it, but you've heard it before. But I had lunch with somebody. We got in a disagreement. She said she was sorry. I said I was sorry. The next day I was still arguing her with her in my head. I said, Lord, she said she's sorry. I said, I'm sorry. Why can't I get over this? And the Lord said, she's just like your mother. Well, Lord, I don't know what to forgive my mother for. Will you forgive your mother for everything you don't like about her? I started saying, I forgive my mother, forgive my mother. And she wasn't even an issue anymore. But if you can quickly forgive, it's not a hard issue. But that was a hard issue with me. So, Lord, in Jesus' name, I ask you to show me every person that I have not forgiven, every person I've let the sun go down on my anger, I ask you, Lord, to show me.
And to forgive means I'm sitting on my judge's bench. Everybody look up here. I'm sitting on my judge's bench. And what forgiveness means is I transfer, transfer her, this court case to another court. I take the people that hurt me and my mom and dad, because they did the same thing, and I walk them over to God's courtroom and I put them in front of the king, the, the great judge, God, judge, God, oh, 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 oh. the great judge of the universe, and I shut the door and I rest my case. That's what forgiveness means, to transfer the case from my courtroom into God's courtroom. So, Lord, in Jesus' name, I thank you that your Holy Spirit is showing me every person I'm angry at, every person I've been bitter towards, every person I've held unforgiveness toward, and just forgive them by an act of your will. It's not an emotion. You don't have to feel like it. You don't have to think it's a good idea, but you're doing it because you love God more than you love that demon of unforgiveness and bitterness. You don't love Wormwood. The king tells the bride in Song of Solomon, Your mouth is so sweet, my darling. People that, that are God's remnant have a sweet mouth, not a bitter mouth. You can sit down, but don't sit down until you're through forgiving. Is everybody sitting down? Lord, in Jesus' name, as a little child, I didn't know I could go to you. And it's been a lifelong pattern of not going to you. I come to your throne of grace now, Lord, to receive mercy and help in time of need. I come to your throne of grace to be conformed more into your image so that I can truly uh, be restored to the to the image you created me to be. In Jesus' name. I come to your throne of grace now. I choose to forgive by an act of my will all these people. I forgive my mother and father. I transfer this case I've had. I transfer it to your court and I shut the door and I rest my case in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I've been tormented. I break the power of of unforgiveness and anger and bitterness. I tear out that root of bitterness, the spirit of wormwood. I command wormwood to go. The gall of bitterness, I command you to go. I command in Jesus' name gallbladder problems to leave in Jesus' name. The spirit of bitterness has caused me to have gallbladder problems go in Jesus' name. Acid reflux, I break your power. That's rooted in bitterness. Arthritis, I command that to go. Self-hatred, unforgiveness of self has to go now. Tormentor, sickness, degrees, demons that inflict pain and disease, you leave now in Jesus' name. I command all spirits of fear, worry in the name of Jesus. All spirits of unforgiveness. Forgive me for vowing I'll never forgive them. I forgive my forefathers for uh, holding unforgiveness, bitterness, revenge, grudges. The root of bitterness has come down generationally. We break generational curses, soul tie curses, cultural curses in the name of Jesus. That gall of bitterness that's passed down the generations. I command you to go in Jesus' name. Anxiety, tension, stress, nervousness, guilt, shame. In Jesus' name, procrastination. I command you to go. Failure. I break the power of the words of death, words of iniquity that's been spoken over these people. I make void every negative word of death that's ever been spoken over them. In the name of Jesus. I break the power of depression. I break the power of failure, bitterness, barrenness. I command you to go. I break the curse of the law of jealousy. Spiritual adultery. Adultery has to go. In Jesus' name, I break your power. I command teeth problems to go. In Jesus' name, sickness, distress, disease, infirmity, you leave now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, procrastination, you come out. Fear of making a mistake, perfectionism, driven to perform, has to go in Jesus' name. Striving to perform, you have to go now in Jesus' name. All spirits of anger, rage, hatred, envy, malice, ill will, enmity, has to go now in Jesus' name. Apostasy, hopelessness, you have to go in Jesus' name. 
barrenness, you had to go. All the spirits of fruitlessness has to go. Every spirit that's hindered them from producing fruit and being what God created them to be. Get out now in Jesus' name. All spirits that cause them to lose heart, give up, quit, let out now in Jesus' name. All spirits of greed has to go in Jesus' name. Break your power. Panic. Panic attacks. Fear of the one world order, you had to go in Jesus' name. Fear of being put in a concentration camp, you had to go. Fear of making a mistake, you had to go. Fear of, of, uh, fear of a firing squad, you had to go. Fear of being beheaded, has to go. Fear of ISIS, fear of Ebola, fear of all the things that we were told are gonna happen, uh, in Jesus' name. Fear of the, of the foreign military that's in this country, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, that we have authority over all the power of the enemy, and when the enemy is actually afraid of us, and that when they come against us, they have to flee seven ways, in Jesus' name. Every spirit that's caused us to flee seven ways, I command you to go. Fear of being blamed, fear of being accused, fear of uh, um, fear that I'll not, I'll weaken and take the mark. I break your power. God's grace is sufficient. You're a lying spirit. We run into the uh, into the God's refuge. He's a shield to those who take refuge in Him. Lord, you said the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous can run into it and are safe. In Jesus' name, Lord, I run into your arms. Forgive me for coming. Pray with me. Forgive me for coming short of the grace of God. Forgive me for receiving a root of bitterness and being just like Esau, selling my birthright for for soup. And God, in Jesus' name, I repent. In Jesus' name, praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. When you feel a release, lift your hands and sing with me. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. You're the king, Lord. Lord, fill me with love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. And Lord, we ask you to bless the food, purify it, sanctify it. Thank you, Lord, that you said in your word that you bless our our food and water. We thank you that you satisfy our mouth with good things. We thank you, Lord, that you pardon our iniquities, heal all of our diseases, renew our youth as that of the eagle. Lord, you said that if we can eat anything deadly or drink anything deadly, it will not hurt us. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you that before the foundation of the world, you knew they were going to be putting pesticides in the food. You knew they were going to be putting GMOs in the food. You knew they were going to be putting uh, uh, preservatives in the food. You knew all of that, Lord, and you made provision in your word. And, Lord, you said we could even pick up a snake, and we're not that stupid to do that. But if we did, it wouldn't hurt us. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. That Lift up your hands. Thank you that these signs shall follow those that believe. They shall cast out devils, speak in new tongues, lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.